always a good thing. Well, we're going to, to return to our, our discussion of, of psychotherapy. And as you may recall from our discussion of various theories, one of the things that, that's really stressed in psychotherapy is the relationship between the, the person who is in therapy and the therapist. Now, that's, a, that's especially true if the therapy is psychodynamic or it's client-centered uh, or it's interpersonal therapy. Uh, those modalities especially stress that uh, what goes on between the therapist and the patient or client is very important and that uh, some of the, the cure uh, that actually takes place takes place because of that relationship. That is, often it is the, the ability of the patient to test out certain behaviors with the therapist or to disclose certain secrets that are very painful or very difficult to someone that they think will be very accepting and caring for them, and then to talk about the implications of that, uh, of whatever that so-called secret might be, leads the person to function much better. So the, the emphasis is, is very much on the relationship. And as you know from uh, recalling Carl Rogers, he put a great deal of emphasis on how the relationship unfolds uh, with the client. Now, there are other aspects in, in psychotherapy we have not yet discussed. One of them is that in most states, there are laws that protect the client-therapist relationship. Now, ordinarily, it's called a privilege. And you'll see, and privilege here uh, exists in almost all states. And here, a person in therapy with a psychologist or a psychiatrist is guaranteed the information discussed will be kept confidential. Now, the privilege extends in most states, actually, also to, to social workers, to nurse practitioners, to other psychotherapists. However, you know, depending on what state you're talking about, uh, more of these groups uh, may be included, or, the, or more groups might be included, or they may not be included. Now, in, in many states, this privilege actually belongs to the client, and that's misunderstood. Sometimes people think the, the privilege of confidentiality belongs to the therapist. That's really not the case. In most states, it belongs to the client. And, and so, in those circumstances, the client is guaranteed that anything that is discussed with a person that they see as a psychotherapist will be protected. Now, at the same time, <clears throat> then, since the client owns the privilege, the client can allow the psychotherapist to disclose the information if he or she wishes. And there are cases where that needs to happen. Now, this client-therapist privilege really does have some complications. Uh, that uh, we are still working to resolve. For example, if a therapist is seeing a married couple and one member of the couple may want the therapist to make a disclosure, let's say that um, you're seeing a couple and one member, one spouse is abusive and the other spouse wants that to be made known, even, may even be to the authorities. Uh, and the other spouse doesn't want that information to, to be disclosed. Uh, the courts have generally uh, stated that if you are in a situation like this, as long as one spouse says they want the information disclosed outside of the therapy session, uh, the therapist can disclose it. Uh, and in this particular case, it, it's probably enabling. That is, the therapist can disclose it, but they, they have some judgment. Now, it gets more complicated in group psychotherapy. In most states, it simply is not clear whether individuals in group therapy are all guaranteed confidentiality. Wang, we, we won't need this till the next section. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the, the problem being, of course, that you have several individuals uh, and you could argue that each of them has, uh, has the privilege for their own information, but since you're disclosing this information 
to other people in the group who are not therapists, uh, it's become unclear whether or not that information is protected. And probably the safest <coughs> thing is to assume it is not protected. However, uh, if you're the therapist in group therapy, you do spend a lot of time trying to get all the members to understand that this information should not be shared outside the group. And it's very important for everybody's uh, feeling of psychological safety that what's talked about in the group remains there. Now, even when you have laws regarding confidentiality, almost all states have limitations on these laws. Uh, for example, if a patient comes to a therapist, and, and this is true in most states, and discloses that he or she is abusing their children, that is, they are actively abusing their children now, the therapist has no choice. You must report that person uh, to, uh, usually to Children and Family Services. You must report the person to some governmental agency. Uh, you cannot take time and try to help the person to become a non-abuser because the thesis is that if, if this person is actively abusing these children right now, these children are in grave danger and you have to do something now. So that's one case where upon being given certain information, you are not free to keep that confidential. And Dr. Sheridan, sure. let me clarify. If the person comes in and admits to child abuse, then you under law are, are obligated to report that. What if another individual comes in stressed because their spouse is abusing their children and they have evidence of this? Are you allowed by law to, to report this? Well, if the client who is seeing you says, uh, I would like you to do this, sure. Because uh, you don't have a relationship with the person who's doing the abusing. So you're very free to disclose that. And if the person comes in and says, you know, I just can't do it, but uh, I feel that uh, somebody's got to do something. And I'm not doing it, and my children are getting harmed, and I'm worried something terrible is going to happen to them. Uh, and I want you to tell the authorities, of course you can, because the, the client has waived the privilege. So, so, so the difference is, is that if, if someone else re reports the abuse, you need their permission to proceed with reporting that, as, well, as opposed to if it's the individual. Actually, you know, you've raised a very complicated, uh, you know, ethical question. It's a good question. See, the dilemma you're in is if it's right at the beginning, the very first session, and the person doesn't give you permission to disclose it, then are you bound to disclose it? Well, first of all, it may not be true. And you don't have a way of knowing if it's true because uh, you're not seeing that other person. You don't have some way of making an evaluation. Now, I think what most therapists would do is they would try to make the best judgment they can. And if they honestly thought that this person has disclosed to them that children are being abused, they would feel a need to act on that. Uh, but if the client gives you that information and then says, but I don't want you telling anyone, uh, you have to make a decision then. Is this you know, a, a manipulation? Or is this person uh, a very, very disturbed and troubled? But they are telling me something that is very true. Namely, these children really are being harmed. I think most people then feel obliged. You've really got to report that. Sure, Mr. Oponi? What about the case of the disease? Because I know like a few years ago, there was a case about, um, I think like a basketball player, college basketball player that was not only infecting uh, people with the AIDS virus. So what if they disclose to you that they have this, this virus and they're passing it along? Do you, dis do you disclose it to other uh, authorities or? Oh, you picked one of the really tough ones. <laughs> The situation that you have a patient who is uh, HIV positive or has AIDS, and they are actively engaging in sexual behavior unprotected, and therefore uh, there's much reason to assume that they are infecting other people. Um, that, that is now you know, still controversial as to whether you can disclose that or not. Uh, I think the, uh, at this stage, probably most people 
you know, would talk very seriously with the client about, uh, you know, are you going to uh, consider not doing this? This is a very difficult uh, situation because supposing you disclose it. Supposing, who are you going to tell? Uh, you're going to tell the police. If you tell the police, uh, they're hardly going to arrest somebody because you've told them that this person is HIV and they're being sexual with other people. Uh, they're not raping other people. Uh, they're not doing it, uh, you know, as prostitutes. So the police would be in a very difficult position. Uh, what can they do? Uh, are you going to inform the partners of this person who is HIV positive and you know being sexual uh, in an unprotected way. Well, probably the person's not going to tell you who those people are, and the person that you're describing who probably would be most dangerous would be somebody who's kind of randomly you know having a lot of sexual contacts, and the person uh, may not even know uh, the names of the people. So the problem you get there is you really have to work with this person. I mean, and you have to make assumptions. One of the assumptions is that if the person revealed this, it must be troubling to him. So, uh, you know, you want to try to talk with them about uh, why are you doing this? And in some cases, you know, it's because a person is just filled with rage over the fact that they're HIV positive and they're just, somebody did it to them, they're going to do it to other people. Uh, but usually you would have to work with the person uh, because there really isn't a place to disclose it. It's one of those kinds of dilemmas where you, you can't improve the public health uh, by having this information. Uh, you've got to try to help this client to change his behavior so that other people uh, are not hurt by this. The, uh, but I remember when uh, we first found there was an AIDS virus and we started this very famous center at, at uh, the medical school I was at. And, uh, and we were having grand rounds one day, and we, we interview. Grand rounds is when you have all of the professionals at a, a seminar uh, or at a conference, and, and you present a case. And it's not unusual at grand rounds to bring in the patient who has uh, some problem. And in some cases, uh, maybe a patient who has had some kind of surgery, or a patient who has some kind of disease, or in this case, a person who has some kind of psychological difficulty. So the patient is being interviewed, and the patient discloses just what you were saying. The patient discloses he's having all kinds of sexual contact. It's unprotected. And I remember everybody in the room, especially our graduate students, had great difficulty with this. Uh, and they wanted to know if the head of the AIDS clinic, who was a psychologist, whether she was going to put this person in jail or not. And she had to explain to them, you know, that nobody would put him in jail. I mean, it, it, this was not perceived, because we, it was so new, it was not perceived as, you know, a threat like stabbing somebody or shooting somebody or, you know, feeding them poison. Uh, and so it, we have spent a lot of our time trying to, to deal with this particular case. But I think it, the state of the art right now is you would simply try to help this person to stop that behavior. You would help them to want to help them to realize that uh, this rage that's in him is causing innocent people to be harmed. Uh, and, uh, and the only way you, you might hospitalize the person, uh, if you needed to do that to help them, is if the person was, was so psychotic in this that they, they were out of control. They had no way of controlling themselves. And, <clears throat> and being psychotic, there is a reasonable uh, uh, excuse, uh, even purpose, in putting them in a hospital. But that's a tough one. They're a very tough one, and it's uh, very recent. And, and people are appalled when you say things like this. But uh, when you really look into the law, you don't have a lot of recourse. So it's, it's a great question to ask. Uh, the other, uh, and, and you got us into this theme of dangerousness. And, and it's interesting because there's no question that the person just described is a danger to other people. But we, we still have not come to a good resolution of this. Now, if the person is dangerous, uh, then the therapist is in a very complicated situation. There was one case in California, a very famous case called the Tarasov case. And let's just see, well, whoop. A 
A student at the University of California at Berkeley was in treatment with a psychologist. This student reveals to the psychologist that he is going to kill his girlfriend, Tatiana Tarasov. The psychologist listens to this person and decides, I think he will kill her. He then informs the person who is the head of the clinic. The head of the clinic then informs the police. The police decide they really can't do anything at this time or they don't act right away. The patient then goes out and kills Tatiana Tarasov. The family then brings a suit against the psychologist and against the head of the clinic for not having disclosed to Tatiana Tarasov that her life was in danger. Now up to that time, the prevailing feeling was you don't disclose what goes on in psychotherapy so that uh, the person says they're gonna kill someone uh, which is not an uncommon thing, by the way, uh, working with uh, certain kinds of patients. Uh, you try to help the person to come to grips with their anger. You assume that they're, they're really not going to do it. But if you are worried, as this psychologist was, because the psychologist really thought that this person would do it. And he was concerned enough that he decided to report it. The supervisor felt that this psychologist really knows what he's talking about, and, and, the, and the supervisor reported it. But up until then, uh, th this was very, very unusual. The courts ruled against the psychologist, the clinic, uh, saying that they had a responsibility to inform Tatiana Tarasov that her life was in danger, and they didn't do it. Uh, and so the case became very famous, uh, and it's called the Tarasov case. Now, it was a California case, and, and so the law then only pertained to cases in California, but it's been used in many other states, so it's now becoming kind of the common practice. And the laws that are getting enacted say things like, if you have someone come in, and this person says they are going to kill someone else, or, or greatly harm someone else, this is where the AIDS issue would get cloudy, they're gonna greatly harm someone else, and, and you, the therapist, believe that, you must inform that person. Now, if you followed me, you can see where the trickiness is in this. If you, the therapist, believe the person will do it, that's when you have to act. So the law says, if, you, if the person disclosed to you, I am going to kill my girlfriend, but and, and that's not uncommon. People come in very rageful, say, you know, I feel like killing my spouse. I feel like killing my girlfriend. I feel like killing my boyfriend. My boyfriend has run off with some floozy. I think I'd just kill him and get it over with. Uh, you know, people get a lot of rage out in therapy, but often your judgment is they're getting the rage out, they're disclosing it to you. They are not at risk to actually do this. Now, if that's your judgment, that I really don't think the person will do this, you do not have to disclose it. And if the person does it anyway, that is, you were wrong, you know, uh, then you cannot be sued for that, or if you, well, you can always be sued, but, uh, but the court should find you not guilty because you acted within the purview of your competence and you acted within the law. Uh, you uh, don't disclose to uh, the law every single person who makes a threat in psychotherapy because that's, that's a very common. And actually, you want people who are feeling enraged to tell you about their rage. And most therapists can make that distinction between whether someone is out of control enough that you really have to worry about them or whether they're finally coming to grips with venting their rage and they're venting it in a very safe environment. They're telling you they feel that way and you can begin to work with them to understand uh, how hurt they feel and how rejected they feel, but it's time to move on and to, uh, to not let this you know, dominate their life. But that's, so that's one side of this. Now, the other side of this 
Uh, since dangerousness you know, usually falls into two categories, you've got the Tarasov case where there's danger to another person. Then you've got the person who comes in and says, life is not worth it. Uh, you know, I, I just keep failing. I've lost my job. My intimate friend has just walked out on me. Uh, this is the second time this has happened to me. Uh, I'm, uh, I don't see anything good happening. Uh, it's just not worth it. I'm going, I'm going to end it. The law would say, if you honestly think this person is going to take his or her life, you must intervene. That is an obvious thing for most of the time is you must put that person in the hospital. But it also means that you know, you're free to make disclosures. Uh, you know, if the person was in a, a family that's a, where uh, you know, the people really are concerned, and while this person is desperately depressed, family members would act, then you are free to disclose some of that so that you can get this person into an environment where people will pay attention uh, and help them. Now, if it's your judgment, since anyone who does psychotherapy often has people who have reached that point where they make disclosures like, I, uh, I think I will end my life. And the vast majority of the times, people do not do that. So if it's your judgment that I, I think the person is telling me this, uh, and you may even ask the person, you know, now are you going to do this? Uh, or are you trying to tell me that you're just in a great deal of pain? And the person says, well, I, no, I don't think I'll do it. Uh, but they go out and do it. They go out and take their life. Or let's say they go out and they attempt to take their life. Maybe they're not successful. Uh, terrible way to use the word successful, but, but let's say they don't end their life. Uh, can you be sued? The courts have been saying no. If, if your best clinical judgment was this person will not take his or her life, then you don't have to act, say, and, and hospitalize them. In other words, you don't have to hospitalize everybody in your office who says they might end their life. You have to make some kind of judgment. But if, for instance, you wrote in the chart, so-and-so was in today, and he or she really looked desperate, and they, they discussed a lot of negative feeling about themselves, and, uh, and they, they, they seem to be falling apart. And so-and-so disclosed that uh, this individual is going to take their life. And they even described the plan. Uh, you know, they said that they've now acquired enough of a sedative. They're just going to take this massive dose of this sedative and end their life. Uh, and you put, this requires careful watching. And then the person goes out, and within 24 hours, they take all of that sedative and they die. The court would probably find you guilty of not having acted on something you should have acted on. That is, the chart clearly spells out how you knew this person was suicidal. They were acutely suicidal. Uh, they had already developed a plan for taking their life. They had already acquired uh, the, what they needed, namely the, the sedative, uh, massive dosage of it to take their life. Uh, so uh, there are times when, you know, if your clinical judgment runs against what, what would be reasonable, then you can be sued. Uh, I should say you'll be found guilty because, again, you can always be sued. Now, there also uh, is a trickiness uh, today because of managed care. Many people who come in have insurance through uh, what we call managed care. And so the insurance company receives information about the patient and they receive the patient's diagnosis. And, and since you know, managed care, uh, and it depends on the company. I mean, some managed care companies are, are, are very good and very uh, open to people being in psychotherapy and are very willing to pay for it, but others are not. And, uh, and I've certainly seen this with managed care. There are managed care companies, when you tell them the patient is acutely suicidal, they will say, well, we'll give you authority to see the patient twice. And you know, you're seeing someone, you know, you realize this person is desperate. You should see this person every day, at least for the next week or so, while you determine whether or not they might need to be hospitalized or not. So 
in order then to convince the managed care company that um, this person's got to be seen, you, they may demand an awful lot of information from you that you don't want to disclose. So the problem that becomes, as you can see, is that there can be a lot of information out there about a person because uh, an insurance company is demanding that much information in order to permit the person to be treated and for it to be paid. Now, again, depending on the way the uh, insurance is set up, but it would not be unusual that the employer has access to that information. So you get into the position that in order to try to help the, the patient and in order to try to make sure that this person uh, you know, is able to continue treatment, that is their, their treatment is covered by some third party, you may disclose more information than you would want to. You may be disclosing more information than the client uh, would want you to, although you should be telling the client. Uh, in fact, you're obliged to tell the client what kind of information you have really had to uh, to disclose. But what, what this tells you is that this issue of confidentiality and the issue I mentioned earlier, you know, of privilege, the, the, the privilege of, that the client has of feeling that the, what they say to you is protected has become less protective in our society in the last decade or so. It used to be much more absolute. In fact, at one point, it was much like the priest penitent uh, privilege, you know, where uh, absolutely the priest never has to disclose what someone tells him in the confessional. You know, that's the, probably the most absolute one that we have. Uh, very close to that used to be uh, the client lawyer privilege, where uh, the lawyer never has to uh, reveal anything. Well, that's, it's not absolute anymore. I mean, if the lawyer really knows that somebody's going to go out and kill somebody else, they have the same uh, expectation that a therapist would. You, you cannot allow someone to die knowing they were going to get killed and not have disclosed it because the client has some kind of privilege. But as the privilege has begun uh, to have more and more exceptions, there are now many more decisions to be made about what really is confidential information in a psychotherapeutic setting and what is information that actually must be disclosed somehow in the public. Now there's another concept you should know about in, in psychotherapy and it's called informed consent. And it means that the client is entitled to know uh, the information like that we have just been discussing. And, and also the client uh, should know what are the possible outcomes in therapy. Uh, and then once the patient knows what information would uh, be disclosed and, and you tell the patient, uh, then it's assumed it's okay to disclose that information. You've told the patient what you're going to disclose, the patient doesn't object to it, you can disclose it. Uh, now, we've, we've often, you know, uh, said in various kinds of medical treatments, uh, if people are entering into the treatment, they should know what the dangers are. So, you know, for example, and, and if you ever read consent forms that you're signing, uh, if you're going to be treated with uh, certain drugs, let's say. Uh, if you actually read them carefully, you probably wouldn't sign them. That is, the, they warn you about every imaginable thing. If any of you have ever read the physician's desk reference, which is the manual that tells you all, uh, uh, you get almost any drug that's on the market is in there, and they describe all the possible side effects. Well, you know, in a huge amount of drugs, I mean, one side effect, they'll say, you know, death is a possibility. Well, death may have occurred in one person, but they're, they're obligated to report all of this, and they don't tell you the percentage of times that certain things occurred, at least most of the time they do not. Uh, but informing the person about what uh, you know, might happen uh, becomes difficult. First of all, if you're a physician, uh, reporting all the side effects would be impossible. I mean, you'd, you'd never get through the day. Uh, so you have to inform people about what are side effects that one would want to be especially alert to because perhaps there is a higher degree of possibility. In medicine, for example, right now, <clears throat> there is a drug called Lipitor, which is used for lowering cholesterol. And it's been found to be very effective. And uh, 
However, there have been enough people who suffered uh, liver damage as a result of taking Lipitor that usually physicians, <clears throat> first of all, will tell you that uh, they think you should go on this. So if you have a cholesterol problem, this will probably greatly help you. But there is a concern <clears throat> that this could have some effect on your liver. So after you take it for a couple of months, uh, physicians will have you tested to see if, uh, that is, they'll have your liver tested to see if there's any damage or any possible sign that you are one of those uh, very small number of people <clears throat> who respond negatively uh, to Lipitor. Excuse me. Now in psychotherapy, <clears throat> the unexpected uh, outcome, and it's difficult um, you know, to disclose this in a way to people, but people come in for marital counseling. <clears throat> well, a possible successful outcome is that the people get divorced. <clears throat> Now, people don't usually come to you for marital counseling because they want you to end up helping them to get divorced. Occasionally that happens. But much, most of the time they come with the expectation you will help put the marriage back together again. So the question becomes, do you tell them that one of the outcomes of this treatment might be that they get divorced? I would say most therapists probably do not disclose that. Uh, but if... Uh, right at the beginning, I mean, even in the very first session, you see there's so much rage between these people and seemingly so little commonality, and one or both of them are already having affairs with somebody else, you might uh, really f be obliged to say, oh, you know, one of the outcomes of this treatment might be that you two would choose to separate, and so we're going to work on your relationship, and then you're going to have to determine whether you want to continue the relationship or perhaps you want to resolve it. The reason why that's tricky is it is not uncommon that you've got one uh, person in the relationship, especially if a person's having an affair, that is kind of open to the idea of dissolving the relationship. And the other person, who is not involved with anyone else, really wants this marriage to stay together. And so disclosing something like that may have very different effect on each person. Now, in psychology, uh, there are rules about the psychotherapeutic relationship and how psychotherapy is to conduct it, and, and it's in the Code of Ethics. And the American Psychological Association has published what is called the Ethical Principles of Psychologists and Code of Conduct. And this is a, you know, a book that filled with examples in that and raises questions and tells psychologists what is really ethically appropriate uh, in our discipline. And so they discuss such issues as we've been discussing, like confidentiality. And as you can imagine, uh, an ethical a manual has to keep changing because we've just described that over you know, the last decade or so, the issue of confidentiality has changed a lot. So if you're going to be current, uh, you really have to, uh, to change uh, the information you give to people because the laws demand that. Uh, now, the Ethics Code also talks about any sexual contact between the therapist and client, and I've mentioned to you earlier when we were talking about psychotherapy, there can't be any sexual contact between the therapist and the client, that that is absolutely always unethical. And in the APA Code, uh, you know, they, they state that there really should be no social interaction with a client until at least two years after uh, the person has terminated the therapy. Although many people would hold it, there just should never be contact because the relationship will always be uh, one-sided. That is, the, the therapist is in so much more powerful a position that it's very difficult to have a real peer relationship with someone who actually has been your client. Also, the Ethics Code talks about reimbursement. Uh, after all, you're going to be paid uh, as a psychotherapist. You have to tell the client. You know, what are the agreements? How much is it going to cost? Uh, when does the person have to pay? Uh, if they don't pay, what might be the consequences? Would you stop seeing them? Uh, and, but you, you want to be very clear about reimbursement issues. Then the ethics code also talks about something that, that doesn't come up very often uh, in discussions, and that is the possible incompatibility between the therapist and the client. And uh, but it does happen, and when it does, 
there is a responsibility of the therapist to see that the client gets referred to someone where that incompatibility might not exist. A uh, person walks into your office, you immediately dislike the person, you the therapist, immediately dislike the person. Uh, now why do you dislike them? Well, it could be a lot of reasons. One is uh, the person may present himself or herself in a very obnoxious way. Uh, it may be clear that uh, you know they're, they're, this is a very hostile personality, not easy to work with. But the therapist has feelings too from other experiences. This person may remind the therapist of somebody that they had a particularly bad experience with uh, or that hurt them a, a lot, uh, that left them. Uh, and the therapist's own feelings may get in the way of being able to listen well enough to this person because they, they're, emotionally they're confusing the person in front of them with somebody else in their life. If any circumstances like that come up where the therapist feels that I really am not the person who can see this person effectively, then you're obliged to refer the person to someone else. And you're obliged to make sure uh, to the extent you can that the person actually gets there. If students are doing psychotherapy, students are obliged to tell their clients that they do have a supervisor. That is, not only are you talking to me, uh, your therapist, but you're actually talking to my supervisor also. And so the, the client needs to know that there is another person uh, in this clinic that the information that's being given in therapy will be disclosed to. Also, with students, it's not uncommon that students are asked by their therapists and students want to, uh, to tape record sessions. So they can kind of go over the session and see how the client uh, talked, what the client disclosed, whether the student therapist really picked up on the salient issues uh, that were being raised, uh, did the student do this sensitively? Uh, did they make good empathic contact with the patient? Uh, does the patient seem uh, to be able to relate well to the student? Is the student rushing treatment? Like are they bringing up issues? The client has suggested, but the client's not really ready to handle them yet. But if, if you're going to, uh, to tape, you have got to tell the client, and the client has got to consent. So if the client says, Taping would make me feel uncomfortable. I'd rather you not do it. You cannot tape. And so you can't have an office, let's say, that's set up in such a way that you can turn on a tape recorder, and, uh, like Richard Nixon, and, uh, and tape everything that goes on in your office, and people uh, won't know about it. People have to know about it. They have to be told about it. And they have to affirmatively agree to it. Now, there are times when you're seeing someone, uh, and we've talked about this a bit earlier, like for the court. And if you are seeing somebody, and, I, and so you're going to have to make a report. You have to tell the client in the beginning that you know, I'm seeing you for the court. I will be reporting the information that comes out of this re, uh, interview or series of interviews to the court. And, uh, and it will become a matter of public uh, information uh, to certain people. So if there are any extenuating circumstances like something like that, that the referral is, is for a court, you have to tell the person ahead of time. The person's got to know exactly what happens with this information that they're going to disclose. Also in the ethics code, they say things like, you know, the relationship between the client and the therapist goes beyond, like, are you going to become sexually involved with the client? It really goes to the point that you should not have any kind of social contact with the person. That is, if you are going to see this person uh, in the clinic, you should not be going to places where, uh, to, hosp to parties or to social gatherings where you will encounter uh, your patient. That I issue is, is more difficult than it might seem. In a big city, like in Houston, it's simple. I mean, the odds are dramatically against the idea that you will uh, run into your therapist at a social event. Uh, you might see your therapist at the same restaurant, but they're at another table. Or you might run into them at a movie, but those are not, I mean, you're not really interacting with each other. 
But it does suggest, you know, that you shouldn't take a referral from someone if, uh, you know, you're a very close friend of their cousin and uh, their cousin frequently has parties that you go to and this person might be there. In fact, if you did take the referral, then you would really be making the decision you're not going to go to those parties because you're not going to put your client in the position of having to interact with you in social settings. Now, in, as I say, in a big city like Houston, probably not a problem. If you live in a small town, this can be a real problem. It, you know, it's, it's very difficult to avoid. Uh, you may live in a small town with only two churches, and almost everybody is a churchgoer. So if you eliminate everybody who goes to your church, uh, you've eliminated half the population of the town, and there are not that many people in the town to begin with. So there, you know, you just have to, to, to use prudence. You have to avoid, to the extent you possibly can, uh, social uh, encounters with the person. Uh, but you've also got to deal with the culture in which you live, and you've simply got to try to be uh, very sensitive. Now, there are outcomes of psychotherapy. And there are, there are different outcomes of psychotherapy. Uh, for some people, they come with a presenting problem like, say, poor relationships with coworkers. Uh, they talk about it, and they leave psychotherapy feeling they are now much more effective. That is, they came to, to get a better understanding of why are they interpersonally so ineffective in this particular work situation. Uh, you have worked with them on their social skills. You've helped them to perhaps practice certain things, given them certain homework assignments to do. They've gone out and they've done them. And they leave therapy feeling, I, this is not a problem. Uh, I have really dealt with this. I feel much better. Others may come in and they present a symptom, say, like depression. And they leave not only not being depressed anymore, but they may even have some real insight into how they got depressed, uh, what are the things that lead them to feel so terribly about themselves, and they may have learned how they can cope with those kinds of things in, in the future. So they feel, not only am I not depressed anymore, but I'm not worried about getting depressed, at least for these reasons, because I actually now understand how I can operate and not put myself in such a situation. There are other people who enter therapy with a very distorted view of themselves. Uh, like they may come in thinking they're really very outgoing and loving and interpersonally effective people and they don't understand why uh, they have not been doing well in a number of relationships they've been in. They may leave therapy recognizing that actually when they came in, uh, they were really quite selfish, uh, very self-centered. Uh, not only were they not warm, they were cold. Uh, not only were they not giving, they were actually withholding. And, and having dealt with all of that, they may have begun to understand they have to make major changes. So the way they presented was, I'm trying so hard and other people just aren't re relating to me. And therapy may take them through this very agonizing process of having to discover that actually you aren't trying very hard. Uh, you say those words, but actually you are so defensive. You are, are so into yourself that, and people pick this up so much, that no one's gonna relate to you as you are now. And you have to start examining why it is that you have this picture of yourself that you're warm and you're outgoing, when all the data you're getting from the outside suggests people don't see you that way. And that's not unusual that that kind of experience takes place. And the fact that, that especially in the early parts of therapy, sometimes a person learns that that individual is not at all like the person they think they are. And so they have to go through that painful process of acknowledging that and then of trying to develop ways to make changes so that they can get to where they want to be. Then there are some people who come into therapy, they don't change at all. In some cases they get worse and they leave therapy very dissatisfied. And that is a, a real outcome. In fact, it's the outcome uh, too often, but, uh, but the fact is sometimes therapy fails. And it, it does happen that sometimes people leave therapy feeling even worse than they felt coming in. Now, there's also an important variable in, in uh, psychotherapy in terms of 
looking at it from the perspective of science that can't be overlooked, and that's the placebo effect. Now, what is a placebo? What's the placebo effect? Sure, Mr. Jones? Well, a, like a clinician tells a uh, patient that a pill is going to do something, some, uh, like, something, and uh, it really actually does nothing. And so, uh, and the patient experiences what the therapist tells them the pill will do. That okay, the that's good. Uh, yeah, and you use the example that probably most common, that is uh, when you use medication. In, uh, in order to determine if the medication is working, that is, there's a real chemical effect, uh, some of the patients, in, in a, if you're doing a study, some of the patients are giving a drug that's active, and some are given a drug that has no action. But the patients don't know whether they're getting the drug that has an action or a drug that doesn't. And now, but the, what the placebo effect is, is that when the group that gets the placebo gets better, it's because they actually believed they would get better. So in psychotherapy, the placebo effect is you come into psychotherapy and you, know, you, you so feel you're going to get better that you get better. And what's been shown, and this is when you, you do controls, if the person just, uh, you know, was let go and talk to anybody, they would get better. I mean, they're so motivated right now, and they have such a sense that my life is going to change, that you really can't attribute the change very much to what happened in psychotherapy. You have to kind of attribute it to the fact that the person so anticipated they would get better, that they got better. And that's especially true if someone has a symptom like depression, for example, and they come in and they feel, okay, now I've committed myself to therapy, I'm going to get better. Well, often they get better. Uh, some of the same people, if they come to a clinic and you say, we're going to take care of you, but we've got to put you on a waiting list for a while. While they're on the waiting list, they get better. Uh, so when you compare the treatment group against the control group, the control group being the waiting list group, uh, you find no differences. So they're trying to determine what are the, the agents or what are the experiences in psychotherapy that actually lead to change versus what are the variables inside an individual that cause a person uh, to change himself or herself. That, then they would do it whether they got into treatment or not. They just, they're ready, uh, they're motivated, uh, are things that have to be taken into consideration when you're, you're trying to deal uh, with psychotherapy. Now, in our, uh, our next uh, session, we're gonna go on and talk about uh, we, we've been talking very much about individual psychotherapy for the most part and what are the responsibilities in individual therapy and I've, I've made references to other therapies to group and family and etc. But the truth is there are many uh, interventions and we're going to go and talk about other interventions. And, and what you're going to see is many of the things I told you that are complicated about individual therapy become even more complicated when you get into group therapy, to marital therapy, to family therapy, uh, to psychosocial rehabilitation, et cetera. And you'll find that you know, with your, uh, your reading that we are kind of uh, in the middle of the book and there's this chapter that, about alternatives. The chapter before that is, is about uh, theories in psychotherapy. Well, we took that right at the beginning of class. So you may want to refresh yourself, but uh, We've really covered all of that. So the next thing we will look at will be what we call alternative forms of psychotherapy. Okay, but for today, we'll stop.